Now, apparently this interview can last no longer than an episode of the newsroom. <laughs> so how many words would that, would that be? No, well, we can cram a lot of words into a, a, an episode of the newsroom, trust me. <laughs> so let's assuming that, say, it's uh, 50,000. That'll be our word count for okay. um, Let's start at the beginning. I know that you were raised in Manhattan. Uh, grew up in Manhattan and, and went to uh, Dickton Scarsdale. Yeah, I was born in Manhattan when I was uh, eight years old. My family moved to a bedroom community of New York City, Scarsdale. Uh, yeah, really? <laughs> uh, 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 which I loved and uh, uh, I was in all the school plays. I was the vice president of, of my drama club. Uh, I had a great time there. So I noted when I was uh, looking you up, as it were, mm -hmm for this uh, e interview this evening, that uh, your father and your brother and sister are all lawyers. Yes. Is there a correlation between lawyering and writing? Here's where there's a, 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 a correlation. Uh, uh, they are all lawyers, uh, and my mother, uh, until she retired, was a public school teacher uh, in, in New York City. She taught fourth grade. Everyone in my family is, is considerably smarter than I am. And uh, uh, I loved the sound of our, our, of our dinner conversations. Um, uh, first of all, anyone in my family who used one word when they could have used 10 just wasn't trying very hard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I loved the sound of these arguments. And uh, so that's what I wanted to imitate when I started writing. And I had read that they took you to a lot of plays when you they were young. They did. My parents, just as a matter of habit, because they went to plays when, uh, when they were young, took me to see a lot of plays. A lot of times uh, I was too young to understand the play that they were taking me to. They would take me to see Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf when I was nine. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what they were thinking. But I loved the sound of dialogue. Uh, it really sounded like music to me. And that and, uh, uh, and these arguments that I was hearing at dinner, also my friends growing up were all smarter uh, uh, than I was. I, I think I was their mascot. I'm not sure. <laughs> why I was allowed into that group, except that I usually lost about $10 Friday nights playing poker. Uh, and I think that's why they kept me around. But I, I would go to see these plays. I wouldn't quite understand what was going on, but I would love the sound uh, of dialogue. And again, that's what I wanted to imitate. But it's also why my Achilles heel is story, uh, because that's not how I entered writing. I entered writing uh, uh, through dialogue. So left to my own devices, uh, I will write 30 or 40 pages a very musical dialogue that doesn't add up to anything. Uh, so uh, I now know that I need to start with a very strong drive shaft, which is intention and obstacle, but that's something we can talk about later. Would you say that intelligence was a prized asset in your family and generally speaking growing up? I would say that the pursuit, that education was, that it, it, it wasn't a matter of IQ. If you were a thoughtful person, um, uh, I, if, if you wanted to learn about stuff. Uh, no one was expected to, to, to be a genius. No one, uh, uh, you, you were expected to work hard in school and do your best. But uh, my, both my parents uh, you know, instilled uh, as, a, as a big value education. I ask because it would seem to me that many of the characters in both your television programs and your movies are extremely articulate people. It seems that you prize the ability to orate, uh, if that's the right word. They are, some would say, hyper-articulate uh, people. Um, I, and it's, it's not that if I want to endow a character with heroic qualities, I'll make that character uh, you know, able to speak a mile a minute or, or, or have a, a larger vocabulary than, say, I do. I, one thing I enjoy is uh, writing characters that are smarter than I am, uh, you know, the way someone else might enjoy writing a character who was stronger than, than they were or could fly. Uh, but you asked, uh, the, it's, it, the reason why they have the ability to orate, as you say, is I like oratory. Uh, I like the sound of it, uh, musically. And when it's good, I can be moved by it, whether it's a politician or a preacher uh, or, in, in the case of the things I write, anyone. Um, I know that you had an initially entertained ideas of possibly being an actor before you turned to playwriting. What was the catalyst in making the decision to be a writer? I, well, when I was young, when I was in, in high school, uh, 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 I did 
want to be an actor. And as I said, I was in all the school plays. And I had never at that point written for pleasure. I'd never written for anything other than a chore to be gotten through for uh, a school assignment. And I'd never written dialogue, uh, which, which was going to be the thing that I loved. Actually, it was my very last day of college uh, uh, that it happened. I was, uh, I, I was a, uh, got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in theater. And my senior year, uh, I was elected president of the, basically president of the drama department. Uh, I, it had a different name, but, but that's what it amounted to. And it came with no responsibilities except one. There was a big party at the end of the year. And at that party, the audience expected sketches. Um, uh, uh, funny sketches somehow parody parodying the year that we just had. Uh, and uh, I ended up writing them myself. I'd, I'd never done anything like that before, but I ended up writing them, uh, and they were a hit. And um, uh, one of the faculty members at the, at the party after the show came up to me and said, you know, you could do this for a living. And I had no idea what he was talking about at all. I honestly thought that he meant you know, I could go from college to college and do parties for like a, be, be a party planner. Um, I thought, what are, you know, what are you talking about? I'm going to New York uh, uh, and I'm going to be an actor. Uh, and I, I did go to New York and uh, I actually got a job with a professional, with a touring professional children's theater company um, uh, that would, uh, it, it, it was professional, it was equity. Uh, but. It was a van and a station wagon, and it was six actors and a stage manager and an assistant stage manager. We went to very small towns uh, in the south, and we put on a repertory of Green Sleeves and The Wizard of Oz and um, uh, Rip Van Winkle, uh, and uh, you did shows in the local middle school gymnasium at 10 a.m. noon and 2 p.m. And uh, uh, and I got a job in this, was which was Fantastic. Uh, I, I go out for two weeks at a time and come back home uh, for a week and go out for two weeks at a time. And uh, we were paid a salary plus a per diem. Uh, uh, and the salary was, was union minimum, which to me was a, a fortune. I think it was $220 a week. Uh, and the key was the per diem, which was $27.50 a day. And the trick was to come home with as much of your per diem as possible. <laughs> Uh, so we would triple and quadruple up in the most inexpensive motel room that we could find at a, at, at, at a Motel 6. If, we were, if our last show was anywhere north of Tennessee, we drove home in one shot. We, uh, we didn't stop because every dollar counted. And there was nothing to do at night except play poker. And it was always very hot. And one night, uh, uh, we were playing cards in, in uh, uh, the motel room. And, we're right next to a freeway where trucks are rolling by and it's really hot. And it just occurred to me, this, it, except for the children's theater part, this seems like a Sam Shepard play. You know, except for the fact <laughs> that we're all here to do a Rip Van Winkle, uh, it seemed like a Sam Shepard play. Well, a few weeks after that thought occurred to me, it was a Friday in New York City. And a friend of mine who I'd gone to high school with and we'd gone to, to different colleges, we were both back in New York. And, he was uh, doing very well. Uh, he, he wanted to be a journalist and, and, and was doing very well as a, a freelance journalist. He had with him his grandfather's semi-automatic typewriter. Um, uh, th this was, it, it was the year that Apple came out with the Macintosh. Uh, that's all it was called, the Macintosh, which had 128K uh, of memory, which is less memory than, you probably have a device on your keychain. Uh, that has more memory, but, but none of us could afford it yet. And, and my friend David had his, his grandfather's semi-automatic typewriter, which is electric keys and a manual return. He was going out of town for the weekend with his girlfriend. He didn't want to schlep it around with him. And he asked me, could I hang on to the typewriter for him? I said, sure. I, at the time, was living in my, I was sharing my ex-girlfriend's studio apartment. I don't mean that she's my ex-girlfriend now. I mean, she was my ex-girlfriend when I was sharing it <laughs> with her. It's a studio apartment, the smaller than the stage, uh, uh, really. But uh, for, uh, I think, $300 a month, I could fold out the futon and, uh, and sleep on that. She was away for the weekend doing the Care Bears tour. This is all real, <laughs> OK? <laughs> 
Uh, and it was a Friday night in New York. It was one of those Friday nights that maybe you only maybe we only have them in New York. Uh, uh, you'll have to tell me, but where you feel like everybody you know has been invited to a party that you haven't been invited to. Uh, and I didn't have two dollars in my pocket, and for some reason, none of uh, like the TV wasn't working in the apartment, the stereo wasn't working in the apartment. None of my friends were around. There was literally nothing to do but stick a piece of paper in this typewriter. <laughs> and I started writing that play about this group of actors in a children's theater <laughs> uh, uh, a company in a small town in the south in a motel room playing cards. And somewhere around page four, this brand new character uh, emerged. There was a stage direction that this character, his name was Shepard. Um, uh, just throws down the script in disgust and says this play is terrible um, <laughs> and goes on a, a rant about the reasons why and in, in this gushing thing everything that I would ever learned the, the four years of college and I'd been taking a lot of intensive classes before that and seeing plays everything I I, I realized while I was writing this that while everybody I was going to school with was learning how to act I was learning what a play was uh, it was just, the information was just coming to me a different way. And I stayed up all night writing dialogue. I was having the time of my life making words bounce off each other and going into the kind of speeches that drive people crazy. But I, I, it, it was all new to me and, uh, and I loved it. And I feel like that night has never ended. Well, that's, that's actually good. And was that the play that uh, your alma mater, Syracuse, produced? Uh, that's right. They, um, uh, I, I did end up writing a play, many, many drafts of it. Uh, uh, the play was called Removing All Doubt. There's a quote from, uh, by Mark Twain, "'Tis better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt." Uh, and, uh, and this play was called Removing All Doubt. And, um, it was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm it, it, yes, my alma mater, Syracuse University, uh, uh, it, they are in residence with a professional company, Syracuse Stage, um, and they sponsored a, a, a stage reading of the play. Uh, and they, in, then in fact, that the play did get optioned uh, uh, to get done. And the, the luckiest thing that's ever happened to me is the two producers sued each other, each claiming that they had the right to do it. The play never got done which really was a, a lucky break because the, the play is like every playwright's first play. It's it is not good, um, I, uh, but somewhere in there somebody saw that there was some kind of promise and, the, uh, uh, and while all the shenanigans was going on uh, uh, with that, my sister who had just graduated from law school wanted to get trial experience right away and someone suggested her that she sign up with the U.S. Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps, um, uh, that it's, it's not what you think, you're not gonna have to shoot anybody, you'll be stationed in Washington, D.C., and you're gonna get trial experience right away. And that's what she did. And 10 months into her, um, uh, her first tour, she, she would sign back up again, uh, she called me and she said, you're never gonna believe uh, where the Navy is sending me uh, on Monday. We have a base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. This was before Gitmo was the, the world's most famous prison. We have a base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and uh, there are 10 Marines down there who are accused of hazing almost to death uh, another member of their platoon in this exercise that's called a Code Red. Um, uh, and uh, the, you know, they're claiming that they were ordered to do it. And I said, Debbie, these guys sound terrible. You should fry them. You should hang them from the highest yardarm. And she said, you know, I'm defending them. Um, <laughs> and I said, oh, then take a lot of notes. Um, I, I <laughs> And I, I wrote A Few Good Men, um, and, uh, uh, and that's how I got started. <laughs> I, I love the way that you just dashed it off somehow. Uh, it, it would take a couple of years to write it. Uh, and again, I, 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 I had a luxury then that I don't have now. I, I, got, I wrote it many, many times. Uh, I wrote it over and over again. The first draft, would always be the way I was supporting myself at the time. Uh, uh, for some reason, I can't remember why, I was no longer doing children's theater. Uh, and I, I, can't, I can't remember why. 
but I, I, I was I had a bunch of survival jobs. Uh, um, I I worked at the half price uh, uh, tickets booth, TKTS, at, at Times Square. I dressed up as a moose and handed out leaflets. Um, uh, uh, I bust tables, and I was a bartender in Broadway theaters. And uh, I wrote most of A Few Good Men on cocktail napkins during the first act of La Caja Fall uh, uh, at the Palace Theater. Um, uh, you work, uh, uh, you get there about an hour and a half before curtain, you set up your bar, and, and you clean everything. Half hour before curtain is what we call a walk-in. It's when the, the, the doors open, you're serving drinks then. Then you have about an hour uh, uh, while the first act is up where there's nothing for you to do except write a play. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so I wrote mine on cocktail napkins. I'd come home with my pockets stuffed full of cocktail napkins. By now, my two roommates and I had chipped in on a Macintosh. Um, uh, <laughs> which, and we had even bought the dot matrix printer. <laughs> Uh, maybe a page every half hour, this thing. <laughs> it seriously went faster on the cocktail napkins. Uh, um, I, and uh, and that, so that, that's, it, 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 I didn't just dash it off. It, it, it would be a while. <laughs> well, here's a writer's process question for you, which is, as a budding playwright, you're writing this play sort of loosely based on what your sister had told you, but how do you know uh, the difference between the first, second, third, fourth, and 20th draft? That's an interesting question. Uh, what I like to do, um, and what I tell other people to do if, if they ask me, uh, is get to the end. Um, don't, you know, if you're 20 pages in, don't start go going back and futzing with it, unless you really feel like you have to. Unless you feel like, it, wait, you know what, I, I got off uh, uh, on the wrong foot, I'm gonna take a mulligan uh, uh, and go back and start again. When you're still feeling your way around a little bit, get to the end. You're going to know a lot more about it by the time you do. Uh, and now you're going to see, oh, you know what? To set up this terrific thing at the end that I've invented, I'm going to have to plant it in the first act here. All this stuff that I did, it's not necessary. Put it aside. It'll go in the next play. Um, uh, you just learn more about it. For me, I, I, not only was it the, with A Few Good Men, not only was it the process of trying to make the play better and better, and by the way, <laughs> with A Few Good Men, I haven't stopped yet. Siri, I'm not kidding. We first, first there was there was my process of writing the play, writing the play, writing the play. Then suddenly it's being done, which in my wildest dreams I did not imagine was going to happen. And not only was it done, it was done by this group of legendary uh, uh, producers, led by a man named Robert Whitehead, who just died a few years ago. Robert Whitehead was a walking theater history textbook. In his career, he produced the Broadway debuts of Tennessee Williams, William Inge, Arthur Miller, and in a stunning anticlimax, me. <laughs> uh, and so he and I would, uh, uh, would work on the play, and I'm still writing the play. Don Scardino uh, um, uh, came in, as we're very close now, came in uh, uh, to direct it, and um, uh, uh, and we were writing the play. I have to, I, I, since I brought up Don, I, I have to mention something that I was thinking about at home because I'm, I'm speaking to BAFTA. And I don't even know what this means, but I, it means something. Um, we, the out-of-town tryout for A Few Good Men, the pre-Broadway tryout, was at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Uh, and uh, the Kennedy Center has a presidential box. There's a box, it's got the seal of the president, the White House has those seats every night. There's some office that gives them away to somebody who wants the, uh, the seats. Every once in a while, the president uh, uh, wants to come, and, uh, and that's where he sits. We were in the middle of tech rehearsals for uh, A Few Good Men. And it, it, tech rehearsals, it's, it's, it's a slogging, miserable experience uh, in which the actors don't need to be good or sharp or anything. They just need to stand where they're supposed to stand so that likes can be focused and you can uh, uh, work on those cues. And invariably, around midnight, something goes terribly wrong and you, you've got to stop for an hour and a half while uh, people do their work, while you know electricians do really hard things very high up uh, uh, in the air. But, you, but you're helpless uh, uh, during this process. Don Scardino, uh, uh, the director, during one of these breaks, and I was very nervous. I, I was a kid. 
uh, uh, weeks away from making his Broadway debut now. Uh, with it, it wasn't a little play. It was a cast of 22, and uh, uh, and so I'm just, I, I have a very hard time being calm now. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> so Don came over to me and he said, um, "You want to get drunk in the presidential box?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I really do." <laughs> um, and we did. And here's why I'm telling this story. Several years later, the play would be done in the West End. Um, uh, the exact same situation we're with the Theater Royal Haymarket, which is a, just a jewel uh, of a theater. First of all, if you're an American playwright, having your play done uh, in the West End is, is a solemn occasion. It's, it's, it's a very, very big deal. Um, this theater is magnificent. It was Oscar Wilde's theater. Uh, and, uh, the, and because it has the designation Theater Royal, there is a royal box. Uh, where royalty sits, and I would imagine, and uh, at least according to the black and white pictures uh, uh, that are up there, several kings and queens uh, uh, have sat there. The same question gets asked of me during tech rehearsals. You want to get drunk in the royal box? <laughs> I said, no. Um, uh, uh, that's th uh, you can't do that. You, you, you can't. For some reason, it was OK for me to disrespect the presidential box, but. <laughs> Uh, uh, but not the Royal Box. And I was just thinking about that uh, uh, before I came here. <laughs> I told you before we came out here that I will wander to places in this conversation that you didn't plan on going to. Yes. Okay. So I've rewritten it many times. I've worked with Whitehead many times. Now I'm working with Don. And then during the rehearsal process, there's four weeks of rehearsal. You're writing the play every day, then you begin the out of town tryout. And it was actually before we did our four weeks at the Kennedy Center, we did two weeks at the University of Virginia as a shakedown for the Kennedy Center. At UVA, at the University of Virginia, students in the drama department uh, served as sort of assistants to our backstage uh, department heads. And so it was that our assistant prop mistress at the University of Virginia was Tina Fey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just so you know, we're halfway through the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, if I was literally writing the episode, I'd look down and say, oh, God, I'm not done with the first scene yet. <laughs> this is going to have to be a two-parter. Um, uh, so all, and then during the out-of-town tryout, during previews on Broadway, you're still writing. So we opened with a version of the play. Then I wrote it again as a screenplay for the movie, and I, and I learned all these things during the play. And remember, by the way, what I'm about to say is the only point I was trying to make. It, it's, it's taken 20 minutes now. Not only was it the regular process that anyone would go through in writing and rewriting a play, but this was really my first, I was still learning how to write a play. So uh, I, I was kind of learning in front of everybody and, and just becoming a better playwright each time uh, I wrote the play. Did the film version, we sent out a national tour uh, of the play, and because I'd now learned new stuff writing the screenplay, I went back and rewrote the play. I rewrote the play for London uh, when we did it there. Uh, and there actually is going to be a revival on Broadway of the play. I'm going to rewrite it again. I have not gotten that play right yet, um, uh, but it's not for lack of trying. <laughs> So as we begin the second half of the episode, you're yes. now at Castle Rock because they're going to make the film version of, of A Few Good Men. And you sort of are taken on as a, I'm not sure if, you, if you're a staff writer or if you're someone who has given a writer's deal there, but somehow you end up there working with... Three them. times in a row. Uh, is, yes. No, there was no overall deal. What happened, as a matter of fact, was I was, um, I was hired to do a movie at Castle Rock before A Few Good Men. Before the play went into rehearsal, um, uh, the rights were not owned by Castle Rock. They were owned by TriStar. Uh, and before the play went into rehearsal, uh, a man who had been then and is now my hero, uh, a writer named William Goldman, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, All the President's Men, Marathon Man, Princess Bride. Uh, I've, I've named a fraction. Uh, of his great work. And by the way, as great a screenwriter as he is, he's got two Oscars, as great a screenwriter as he is, he's an even better novelist, as 
great a novelist as he is, you have to read his nonfiction. Um, I, I strongly recommend two books. Uh, one is called Adventures in the Screen Trade, um, which even if you have no interest in movies, you're not going to be able to put that, the book down. If you're a movie fan, you're, you're going to ignore your kids. You're, all you're going to do <laughs> is read this book. Another one is called The Season, which is an examination of, uh, of Broadway. I'll throw in a third one, Hype and Glory. He was, Bill and Goldman in one year, was asked to be a judge at the Cannes Film Festival and the Miss America pageant. Um, <laughs> and he turns it into a fantastic book. A, I'm getting there, man. Uh, 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 someone had pitched a story to Castle Rock, a movie idea, based on a rumor that they'd heard. Uh, and it was simply a one-line pitch. A trauma surgeon and a woman get together and conspire to defraud a medical malpractice insurance company. That he would operate on, on her, screw up the operation in some non-life-threatening way, but screw up the operation on purpose. She would sue him for $30 million and they'd uh, split the money. Castle Rock bought the pitch. Um, Jonas McCourt uh, is the writer who made the pitch. Uh, hired Jonas McCourt uh, uh, to write the screenplay, but for whatever reason were not satisfied. So they wanted to hire another writer and they wanted to go to Bill Goldman, who they'd worked with uh, a couple of times, Princess Bride Misery, uh, uh, he wrote. Um, Bill said, I really like this idea, but I don't have the time to write it now. Why don't you identify some new, young, inexpensive guy who you think I'll like, guy or woman, uh, uh, who you think I'll like, um, and I'll take them under my wing and uh, I'll kind of guide them through this. And that was me. Um, uh, uh, Castle Rock had read the play script of A Few Good Men. Um, and uh, uh, I got a phone call from this, again, this man who'd been my hero, uh, saying, uh, do you want to have lunch tomorrow to talk about a movie? Uh, we both lived in New York. And, you know, I went through the whole list of which friend of mine is pretending to be William Goldman before. Um, and I met him for lunch. My heart sank right away because really before we hit the seats, we, we shook hands. He said, listen, I don't think this is going to work out. Um, uh, I think that you're a, a terrific young playwright, but you've never written a screenplay. You've never even written a lousy TV pilot. Um, I don't think that we're going to have you know, common vocabulary. Uh, and I, I didn't know what to do because it was lunch. We hadn't ordered yet or anything. It was suddenly very awkward. Uh, and uh, I said, listen, I, uh, I can't convince you that I have more experience than I do, but maybe I can convince you that the kind of experience you're talking about isn't something that'll be that important here. And by the end of the lunch, I uh, said, okay, we've got a deal. Um, uh, and so uh, I wrote, uh, I wrote the movie Malice, <laughs> which ended up being kind of misbegotten, um, uh, a bit of a camel, which is a horse made by comedian. Um, uh, but in the meantime, Castle Rock bought the film rights to A Few Good Men from TriStar. Rob Reiner, uh, uh, who owns Castle Rock, wanted to direct it, and suddenly I had to get to work on the, uh, on the movie of, uh, of A Few Good Men. Well, and which, of course, led to the American president. And then right after that, uh, um, Rob wanted to do another movie. He wanted to do another Washington-based uh, uh, movie, and uh, you know I thought, great, uh, uh, let's do that. Robert Redford heard that that's what we wanted to do and called Rob Reiner and uh, myself in for a meeting, uh, and um, he said that he has always wanted to play a widowed president of the United States, um, and I said. Gee, that's, uh, uh, that's great casting. Um, uh, let's do that. And uh, Redford said, well, what, 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 what's, what's your pitch? What's the story going to be? I said, I don't know. Um, uh, <laughs> I, and and uh, thank God Rob Reiner was there. He said, listen, you're going to have to trust me. Just let him go away, and it'll be a while. Uh, <laughs> but let him go away. He's going to come back with something 400 pages long. <laughs> Somewhere in there is going to be the movie that you're going to want to do. And uh, uh, that's what happened. At the 11th hour, Bob and Rob had a falling out. Michael Douglas came in. Uh, uh, Redford stayed on as uh, a producer of the movie. And uh, so those were the three movies I did at Castle Rock. Uh, uh, a Few Good Men, Malice, The American President.
Yes. Um, so we must now go to the television because there's so much to talk about there. Mm -hmm. um, it would seem to me, and I will just lob this in your direction and you can do whatever you like with it. It seems to me that your television shows, which are, as we said earlier, are kind of heightened experiences, are really kind of, I find, very touching, very moving, wish fulfillment fantasies. They are very much the world that we wished we live in, but unfortunately don't. And, 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 and it's also about relationships. You're very, very keen and interested on all of those dynamic relationships that swirl around whatever the behind the scenes event is that you have chosen to focus on. Can you speak a little bit to the wish fulfillment fantasy part? With the West Wing, for instance, um, uh, when I thought about, and listen, the, the, the West Wing, when I thought about uh, uh, doing the West Wing, what occurred to me was that uh, generally in popular culture, in this country at any rate, and uh, uh, from what I know of UK shows uh, uh, about government, Yes Minister, um, uh, uh, and, and some others, it's roughly the same there. Uh, that our leaders are generally uh, uh, portrayed as either Machiavellian or adults. And because of my magnetic pull to wish fulfillment, uh, I thought, well, what if you know, we see a group of very competent people um, who they'll lose as much as they'll win, but will always know that no matter what, they're getting up in the morning, going to work, trying to do good, uh, uh, thinking about us. Um, I, I'm, I'm starting to, to see these scenes and, and, and like these people. I, going one back, my, my, my first TV series was Sports Night which happened because uh, I had ESPN and its flagship show, Sports Center. It turned me from a, a casual sports fan into a kind of a rabbit uh, uh, one, but in, an, in a nice way. I don't go crazy. Um, uh, but it was while I was watching, uh, while I was writing, rather, The American President, uh, I would be writing very late into the night. Uh, I was living in a hotel to just kind of keep me company while I was falling asleep. Uh, I would turn on the TV. I would turn on Sports Center, and it, it began to be very familiar to me. The cast of characters uh, on the show, the set, it was fun. And where my mind went was, oh, that must be a great place to work. You could make friends there. You'll meet the woman you're going to marry there. It, 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 it'll be great. And, and so I wanted to create that world. I think that you know there are a lot of different kinds of artists who paint, write music, dance, sculpt, write movies and television shows and plays. Uh, and they do it for a lot of reasons. But when I look back at the things I've written, which I don't do that much, um, uh, I, I really, uh, I, I'm just much happier when I'm looking forward and thinking about the next thing uh, uh, that I'm going to write. But when I look back at, at the things that I've written, the common thread that I see in everything except for the last two movies that I wrote, Moneyball and The Social Network, um, uh, which were just different animals. W certainly at the television shows, when I look back at the television shows, the common thread that I see is that it's okay to be alone in a big city if you can find family at work. Um, and I'm, I have no idea what happened to me along the way that made me uh, uh, want to write that. But I do, and, and I find joy in it. And I find joy in, uh, and again, I want to make it clear. As an audience member, I'm crazy about characters like Walter White and Tony Soprano and Dexter, um, uh, anti-heroes. Uh, when I'm writing, uh, for better or for worse, and plenty of times it's been for worse, I like to just celebrate what's best about us um, and uh, the, the best in our potential. How many episodes of The West Wing did you write? Uh, I wrote 87 episodes of The West 87 Wing. 87 episodes. Uh, if the people here knew what that took <laughs> in terms of the sheer, what about the pressure of the deadlines and everything? 
the pressure, the schedule is ferocious. Uh, there's no doubt about that. That's the big difference between series TV, and I, I want to get at what you're getting at in a moment. The big difference between doing series TV and doing a movie or a play is the time. Uh, if you're in the middle of a screenplay, or if you're in the middle of a play, and it's not going well, if you're not writing well, uh, you can call the producer, you can call the studio, whoever is waiting for it, and say, it's not going well. I said I was going to deliver uh, in September. It'll probably be more like uh, uh, November or the end of the year. Um, uh, and they'll understand. E even if they don't like it, they'll, they'll understand, and, uh, and that's what you're going to do. Series television, you have air dates to me, predetermined air dates that were determined before you started uh, uh, writing. You got to uh, hit that air date, which means this is just the worst thing that there can be uh, uh, for a writer. It means that you have to write even when you're not writing well. And then you have to point a camera at it uh, and show it to everybody. Um, I, and so that, yeah, there's the, I mean, there's, you feel the, you constantly feel like you have a term paper due. There, uh, there's that pressure. But that's nothing compared to putting a script on the table uh, uh, for the table read that you know uh, you, you, you didn't get all of it. Um, uh, you, you know, you want every show to be as good as your best show. You write 87 episodes of anything. One of them is going to be your 87th best. And uh, I'm not nearly good enough for my 87th best to be good enough. I must ask you, though, uh, was that by choice or? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I have, I mean, I just finished my ninth, ep uh, my ninth season of television with the second season of the newsroom. Uh, in, in every case, I have had a writing staff that's been indispensable. They, um, uh, uh, I turn in a script, and my brain is like porridge. and. Uh, uh, they start pitching ideas uh, at me that they have been thinking about and working on while I've been writing uh, the script that I've just been writing. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, t t it's nice to finally be in a room with people uh, uh, and, uh, and talking about it. So, so they have been uh, uh, indispensable. Because I came up as a playwright, um, uh, because I never, the only job I've ever had in television was as creator, executive producer. I've, I've, I didn't come up as a staff writer through the chain and have that kind of experience, that kind of apprenticeship. Uh, because I came up as a playwright, I only know how to write by myself uh, with, with the door closed. I really envy people who are writing, part of a writing team. Um, uh, it's, it's not so lonely and you can share the pressure and there's somebody else there uh, with ideas. I just honestly wouldn't know how to do it, wouldn't would know how to go about writing. So. But that's not the reason why I, I wrote all the episodes uh, uh, myself. The reason is I'm, I'm not an empire builder. I'm, uh, I, I, don't, I create these shows so that I can write them, uh, not so that I can write the first few, and now we've got the thing up and running. Uh, uh, let's turn them out like uh, it's on an assembly line, and I will cash the check. Uh, I like putting on a show every week. Uh, and uh, if I didn't write the script, there'd be no reason to have me around. Uh, uh, there really wouldn't. So I, I, I'm trying to uh, earn my place in the family. Uh, you've worked with a director, Tommy Schlammy, a lot over the years, yeah. and he has been, in a sense, your writing partner, except he does the directorial work. Calling him my writing partner is, I, I think, a fair characterization. Yes, on Sports Night, on uh, the West Wing, on Studio 60, he was unavailable for uh, off the newsroom, but we, I promise we'll work again together again. Um, uh, Tommy, uh, in directing the pilot and in being uh, the principal director uh, of the series and the other executive producer, uh, basically the division of responsibilities was I wrote the script and Tommy did everything else. Um, uh, including, by the way, uh, he, he's the one who did the walk and talk, not me. And <laughs> Uh, it, uh, it it happened. Um, it happened like like the second day of sports night. There was this scene that took place in an office, and I, I write scenes that are much longer than they're supposed to be. And uh, uh, 
uh, and it was like an eight-page scene that took place in an office. And he took me over to the set, and he said, uh, listen, um, uh, would you mind if, you know, we started the scene here in the office, but then if, you know, Felicity's got to get up and photocopy uh, uh, this thing, and Josh Molina can follow her, uh, um, and they can go from this room, they can get a cup of coffee over here. It'll just, um, what he was trying to say in a nice way is that I write scripts in which nothing happens, and so he, <laughs> he needed something visually interesting to be going on. Um, uh, and so it was Tommy who invented the walk and talk. Well, that's, I'm glad that you've clarified that yeah. for, for history purposes. Um, the Newsroom, your current show, uh, which is really gathering steam, I feel. You know, it's really sort of finding itself yeah. in the second season. Um, what was your uh, intentions when you began the show? Because I, I think of it as being kind of like the other half of the, of the coin of the West Wing. West Wing is we want our political leaders to be good people and to have our interests at heart. And with the newsroom, we want the media, a very powerful institution, to also be responsible yeah. and basically do the right thing. Well, that's, I'm really glad that you asked this question. Um, uh, first of all, yes, uh, uh, that's exactly right. I thought, um, uh, you know, the media uh, is at least as uh, disliked as politicians. Um, uh, so maybe, uh, you know, I can do the same thing here. So uh, uh, i show them being good. I will tell you what my intention wasn't. And this is, uh, this has never happened to me uh, before. Uh, I have plenty of experience with, uh, uh, with writing something and having it not be what I wanted it to be. Uh, I have plenty of experience with things getting bad reviews. But if you've ever um, met someone for the first time at a party, in a job interview, uh, on the first day of class uh, at school, if you've ever met someone for the first time and uh, said something that was taken the wrong way, uh, uh, that was misunderstood uh, uh, through no fault of yours or theirs, then you know that everything that happens after that in that conversation at the party or in the job interview, et cetera, is going to be seen through that slightly fractured lens. Um, uh, and it's going to be very difficult to, to get that moment back. And that's what happened uh, uh, with the newsroom. Never was it my intention? I've, I, writing the pilot or writing the 18 episodes that have come uh, uh, after the pilot, there has never been a moment when my intention was to tell professional journalists that this is the way uh, that it should be done. And professional journalists thought and still think that that is what I'm doing. That I'm, now the show is set in the recent past and that the reason I've set the show in the recent past is to leverage hindsight into victories uh, uh, for our characters. The show is set in the recent past because I didn't want to make up fake news. Uh, I, uh, it, the, the show would seem somehow not real in, in a way that Sports Night was able to get away with. You know, when we would see a shard of a broadcast on Sports Night, it was okay if you just said that uh, uh, you know, wide receiver Terrence O'Malley, you know, has a sprained ankle um, uh, and will be sidelined for Sunday's Eagles game. That can go by you and sound real, even though I just made up that name. Um, uh, you can't do the same uh, with news and have it seem like the world that we're living in. The show was set in the recent past for that reason and because I also like the option of going to the dynamic of the audience knowing more than the uh, characters do. Uh, that's a fun thing. Never was it meant uh, uh, to say, hey, journalists, you're bad at this. Let me show you how it's done. I, I would have no way of doing that, and that doesn't sound like good entertainment to me. However, uh, I don't think that I can ever get back that first impression. Hmm. It's interesting, because that would never have occurred to me personally. I didn't ever read any criticism about it that suggested well, that. But. Uh, um, uh, May I say that you've never read any criticism that has suggested that? I, I personally haven't, no. Uh, can I come live with you? Uh, because uh, your house may be the only place left that I can... Uh, 
this the newsroom has made uh i don't know how many people a vocal number of people very angry um uh, uh they f they feel insulted by it what i like about it is the rationalist quality i like the idea of seeing things from the recent past with different perspectives i like the way that you tackle issues that really i have to say bug the shit out of me for example in the pilot uh when you have will uh say and talk America about is the, the greatest country in the world. The f well, yes, and the yeah. but the false equivalency of the media is yes. that I find really irksome. I find that really irksome too. Um, I, it, yes, I find that really irksome too. Uh, that is, there are a number of uh, examples where Will or somebody, one of the characters, is saying something that I believe. However, uh, the show is also not meant to be a ventriloquist act uh, uh, where I get to kind of mouth off like it's the speaker's corner uh, every Sunday night at, uh, at 10 o'clock uh, using them as mouthpieces. They are characters. Um, uh, and as I said at the beginning, they're quite a bit smarter than I am, certainly more politically sophisticated, know more about the, uh, uh, the news uh, than I do. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, I've, I've never had an, a, a, a political uh, agenda with, with any of this. I have one political uh, agenda. I, I, I've had it um, uh, for a long, long time. All my shows and all my movies. When I was 11 years old, um, I, I had a crush on a girl in my class named Jenny Lavin, and she was working at the local McGovern for President campaign headquarters. McGovern, if you're too young or not American enough to know this, uh, George McGovern in 1972 ran against Richard Nixon and probably knew the names of the people who voted for him. Um, I, 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 it just got walloped. Anyway, Jenny Lavin was volunteering after school at the local McGovern headquarters stuffing envelopes and whatnot, so I thought it'd be a good idea if I did too. And uh, one weekend they put us all in a bunch of buses and took us to a town called White Plains, right next to Scarsdale. Uh, uh, it's the county seat, because the Nixon motorcade was going to be coming through, and we were supposed to hold up signs that said McGovern for president. And that's what I was doing when a 143-year-old woman came up from behind me, <laughs> grabbed a sign out of my hand, whacked me over the head with it, threw it on the ground, and stomped on it. My only political agenda ever has been the slim hope that that woman is still alive and I'm driving her out of her mind. I, I have read that, that you said that the extent of your political activism is writing a check. I would posit to you, though, that you care because I don't think you could write the newsroom or the West Wing and not care. That would be impossible. I do care. I, I, I care very much. And um, uh, when I say that the extent of my political activism uh, is writing a check, it's, uh, uh, that's a symptom of laziness uh, on, on my part. Um, I, 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 do, I, I think I do things when, I, when I'm asked to do them. I, I know that I could do more. Uh, and I know the people who get the check are probably happy uh, uh, with the check, but writing a check is, uh, anyway, I care uh, um, about a number of things, um, but I want to make sure that when I'm writing something, if I'm writing a, an episode of television, a movie, uh, or a play, that my fidelity is to the rules of storytelling and not uh, activism, because uh, those are, are, are two different things. Um, uh, I love telling stories. Uh, I, I love doing that. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I, I am just as happy, if not happier, making somebody slip on a banana peel uh, than uh, I am you know, writing a, a, a fiery speech about something. If you had your druthers, what would you be doing? You know, I, I am doing it. Um, uh, I... Um, I, I, I'm unimaginably lucky. Uh, when I was starting out, you know, I, I didn't dream I'd have half the opportunities uh, uh, that, I've, uh, that I've had today. Uh, I get to earn a living doing exactly what I love doing. Uh, I get to work with uh, phenomenal 
uh, not just directors, producers, and actors, but uh, incredible craftspeople, um, a, a prop person who, when they're making a table, you know, they care so much about the corner uh, uh, that they're making. I mean, they, they take as much pride in the newsroom uh, uh, as I do. I get to work with those people uh, every day. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, I have my druthers. Now, I, um, there's a great line in broadcast news when Albert Brooks and William Hurt are out on the balcony and William Hurt says to Albert Brooks, you know, what do you do when your real life uh, is better than your wildest dreams? And Albert Brooks says, keep it to yourself. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I feel like I should do. But uh, I, I must have done something incredible in a past life to be as lucky as I am in this one. I must have cured something um, uh, to, 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 uh, to be able to do the things that I get to do. Are you like uh, Robert Redford in The Way We Were, though, who, for whom someone has all come too easily to? Or did you really feel that you, you worked? You worked for this. I did. Uh, I, I, I worked hard. I, I, I still work hard. Um, I, uh, and that, that, that's an important distinction. Like every single writer I know, um, I, I have a, a, a neurosis that is healthy. Uh, uh, which is that we all think that the next thing we write is the one where we're going to get found out to be a fraud. Um, uh, and you're terrified of it. And success, any measure of success, uh, actually brings a, a lot of fear of what's going to happen next. I, I, I remember, um, I don't think three minutes yet had gone by after they put an Academy Award in my hand, when I was thinking, oh God, um, it's it, the next thing, it will only be disappointing. It's whatever I write next is going to be the thing that I did after this, and this would be an excellent time to die tragically in an accident. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, I, I work hard. Um, I, I fail at least as much as I succeed. Uh, that's never okay uh, uh, with me. I've, I've, I live and die with these things. And I'm, I'm not talking about an entire series. I'm talking about an episode. Um, uh, you know, Sunday nights come uh, I, and I, uh, I, I start to feel you know, very nervous and, uh, and I'm shaking. And during that hour uh, uh, when the show is on, um, I... I don't know if something happens to me where, uh, where I just get quiet and feel like, you know, on the other side of this, I, I don't know what there is. Well, uh, it's good that you just ended right there because the end credits are rolling. You've, you've said your 50,000 words. <laughs> this is a real pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me here. I, it's a real thrill. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.